In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. There was a photographer for a national magazine. He was assigned to get photos of this great forest fire that was taking place. And some smoke at the scene had hampered him, and so he asked his home office to hire a plane. And arrangements were made, and he was told to go to a nearby airport at once, and that a plane would be there waiting for him. And when he arrived at the airport, a plane was warming up near the runway, so he ran and jumped in, and he threw his equipment in, and he yelled, let's go, let's go. And the pilot quickly swung the plane into the wind, and soon they were off into the air. Fly over the north side of the fire, yelled the photographer, and make three or four low-level passes. Why? asked the pilot. Because I'm taking pictures, cried the photographer. I'm a photographer, and photographers take pictures. And after a pause, the pilot said, you mean, you're not the instructor? <laughs> True story. How often in life do we find ourselves in helpless situations? It is so easy to face something fearful and turn away. To run and hide for a better day. And then sometimes it seems as though there's no way out. No one to help us through the challenge. Or that we are even alone in those joyful occasions. Today is Pentecost Sunday. When Jesus breathed upon those disciples, those fearful disciples, it is the day the church took off. Jesus says that indeed there is help and presence for us in the moments of life, the good, the bad. And it is the Holy Spirit, the very breath of God. We are told, and you just heard, the disciples were all gathered in one place and then suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. This is the same Spirit that moved over that formless void in the beginning of all creation, making order out of chaos, moving over the waters of nothingness. And then suddenly there's order and there's life. This is the same Spirit that breathed life into Adam and Eve into you and me. The same Spirit that breathed life into the bones, those dry bones in the desert in Ezekiel. That same Spirit that conceived Jesus in Mary's womb. The same Spirit that moves today that will be present and indwell these who are being baptized. And it is the same Spirit that brings order out of chaos, even today. The Holy Spirit is our internal compass. Think of it as your internal GPS, if you will. Leading, comforting, and empowering us to carry out the work of God, the serious business of Christian living, healing, loving, reconciling, saving souls. Throughout the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit elicits images of mighty wind and fire, and the dove descending and the Spirit moving undercover in mysterious sort of ways that we don't fully understand, and sometimes in ways that we don't understand until we get down the road a ways in life and we look back on our life and see, oh, that's where the Spirit was moving in my life. 
even Christians, do not fully realize the inner power of the Holy Spirit to handle things that they believe they must take into their own hands, even the most trivial of things. When something seems like a coincidence or a nudging in our lives or an inner voice of some kind and we choose to listen, then perhaps this could be more than a happenstance. It could be the voice of God. It could be the Holy Spirit moving in us. Back in 1998, Susie and I were, before our our children were born, um, we had just gotten back to Raleigh, North Carolina. We'd been in London, and we were visiting with her parents. They'd come to town from Charlotte and for a couple days, and we'd gone out to dinner, and we had left, and we were heading back, and we were going to go back to their hotel and visit with them for a while. Um, and if you've ever been to Raleigh, uh, downtown Raleigh, the main avenue out of Raleigh into the suburbs of Raleigh, if you will, is Glenwood Avenue. It's a four-lane road. And we were heading down Glenwood Avenue. We were making our way. It was raining. It was getting late. It was dark. And I remember there was this moment where suddenly I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye. But I wasn't sure. I didn't get a really good look. But I could have sworn to myself that there was something there. But I knew we were in a hurry, and we kept going, and it was raining, it was raining heavily, but as we went down and we made our way towards the hotel, something continued to nudge within me, telling me to turn around, to go back. I don't even think I told Susie, and all of a sudden she's probably wondering, why are we turning around? And then I said, I think, I think we saw, I think I saw something. And so we turned around and we went back and we made our way and we pulled off to the side of the road and cars were coming up and down Glenwood Avenue and there it was. It was a dog. Dog story. And as we approached, the lights shone on this dog and it was clear that it was some sort of retriever. It was a golden retriever. And I got out of the car and I knew I needed to be very careful how I approached because if I scared it, it could run off into the road and get hit by the the oncoming traffic. And as I got out of the car and I approached very carefully, the dog stood up and it had three legs. And immediately my mind went places. Somebody threw this dog out on the side of the road and abandoned it in a storm, pouring down rain. This dog, three legs, standing there. And I knew in the moment that I had to do something. So I went and I grabbed it by its collar and there was no identification on the collar that I could see. And so I grabbed it and pulled it back and I picked it up and put it in the back of our car. This wet, smelly dog. And we went home, and we never made it to the hotel. Now, we didn't have any dog food, but that dog ate a whole loaf of Wonder Bread. (laughs) And it was loving it. And I continued to wonder, you know, and I'm thinking, "Why, why us? Why now? So I looked under the collar, and I found in faded marker a phone number. And I called that phone number, and I was ready to give my peace of mind to this person. I cannot believe that you would leave this dog out on the side of the road, this three-legged dog. And immediately, the man broke down. He started crying. He was overcome He could not believe we had found his beloved dog. And he said, tell me where you are. I'll be there as quickly as I can. Turns out, this poor dog was scared 
A thunderstorm had come through in the afternoon. The dog was scared and it ran off. It ran three miles from its home, this three-legged dog, and was tired and worn out and found its way right on this shoulder, the white line on the side of the road. He came, he brought his grandchildren with him. It was probably about 10 o'clock at night. And you could to see that reunion. It was unbelievable. But that's not the end of the story. About a week later, this dog ran upstairs on a Saturday, managed to push the door open and wake up the owners and the grandchildren who were there in that house, and that house burned down. That family got out. And it wasn't until about three years later that Susie and I were having breakfast one morning, and we were reading the newspaper back in the day when you read the newspaper, and, well, at least the physical newspaper. And there, there it was, the front page of the local news in Raleigh, three-legged dog saves family from house burning. City of Raleigh to award dog prestigious medal. <laughs> I'm not saying this just to say it, and, and you may be saying to yourself right now, yeah, right, Jamie, this sounds too existential. It's like, may the force be with you kind of stuff. But I'm telling you, I'm here before you today, and I will be for future days too. <laughs> As someone who personally knows the power of the Spirit, and I could share many other stories with you, mysterious stories, and I know you could do the same with me as well. You see, throughout the ages, churches and people like you and me have fallen into the trap that allows us to believe that what we have accomplished is done through our own power. But the good in fact, very often, this power is God's power, and we may not recognize it. It's not our power. Despite, despite being the most mysterious part of the Trinity, and it is, the Holy Spirit is in fact freedom. And there is power in freedom. It brings light into the innermost parts of our beings. It grabs hold of our imaginations. And ultimately, in direct contact with our souls, it is the very breath of God moving within and about us and across our finite time of which we are bound. It resides in the deepest parts of our beings. It is non-interference on an eternal scope. It is a timeless interaction with God that not only gives the individual an assent to concrete belief, but also a foretaste of the eternal promise. The Holy Spirit mysteriously dances with certain ones in profound ways and reveals itself to everyone as the same Spirit that moved before all created time. A kinetic movement of life, giving heartwarming, coincidental, assuring experiences, and sometimes the bestowing of special knowledge and even gifts. You have gifts. You have something that is ready to be discovered. The Spirit resides within you. On Pentecost, the Spirit exploded on the scene. And thousands were affected by one burst of God's power. But the Spirit also works through the church. The Spirit works through you the institution, which has relied upon the Holy Spirit's power in a steady, measured unleashing through prayer, through worship, through fellowship and service, 
Christians are provided with that staying power. And when we find ourselves alone in the cockpit of life, which we will, and we do, and fear has gotten the best of us, we must remember the great instructor, the great advocate, the Holy Spirit is along for the flight. For the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the mind counsel of might, of knowledge, of godliness, and of the fear of God. And this only begins, only begins to show how unlimited the Spirit of God truly is. Amen.